Hi, this is Moby. Welcome to the Fire Show. Hello, hello, hello. Today, I'm sitting down with Melissa Hoosman. She's the founder of Diamond Block Creative. A surprise, it's a creative agency that works with small businesses and startups to clarify their marketing strategy, fine tune their messaging and positioning, and then developing on brand assets, which I didn't know what it was until it turns out that is your visual identity, your websites and engaging content, pretty much everything on the internet. So today in this episode, we talk about her perspective as a professional behind the scenes of what brands get right and don't get right in their marketing campaigns. We're going to be talking about how entrepreneurs in general can get too attached to their ideas and they can't take feedback or change. Why it's important to take a step back and look at the story that you're telling people about your brand before going in and just creating content which doesn't really fit your vision. If you enjoyed this, let me know at NotThatMoby on Twitter or Melissa at MK underscore H-U-I-S on Twitter on or Instagram. Next week, we're going to do a follow-up episode with me and my friend Sujin Patel, author, entrepreneur, speaker, and friend. I said that twice. I don't care. And we discuss the next level of working with marketing consultants. What do you need to ask someone you're going to hire to help you on your marketing before you hire them? How do you tell their bullshit? Stay tuned and hope you enjoy this episode. Hi, this is Moby from The Fire Show and we are in the startup studio at Galvanize produced by Mia Tech Ventures and North Shore Productions. I'm joined today by Melissa from Diamond Block, an agency, a creative agency. How are you, Melissa? I'm doing well. How are you doing? Good. And that was my radio intro. That was great. I love it. <laughs> I had learned. Tell me something good about your week. Oh, well, it was actually my birthday this week, so... Yes, yes! It was, a, it was a great birthday week. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Still celebrating. I'm having breakfast for dinner tonight with all my friends. Boom. Where are you going in Austin? Uh, just my house. Oh, sweet. Yeah. Keep okay. it simple, you know? And then we'll go out, probably. Okay, yeah. Rainy absolutely. or something. Exactly. <laughs> so, uh, you just mentioned it's been six months... Yes. ...since you started your own thing. Yes. How is... Oh, you're going to go super high level. How is that going? It's going well. I think it's uh, going slower than I thought mm -hmm. because everything I always assume it's going to happen immediately and it doesn't. But I'm learning a ton. I feel like every day there's a new challenge and learning as I go, yeah. learning on the fly. What is Diamond Block? Diamond Block is an agency and basically our mission is to cultivate potential. So whether that be in leaders, in ideas, in existing businesses, in startups, in an existing brand, in a future brand, we're here to cultivate potential. And so we're trying to pull out the existing things. We just believe that there's inherent potential in all people and in all ideas and in businesses, even if there's a challenge facing them. So we are trying to find what that little raw piece of nugget is, diamond block, if you will, and pull it out and pull the diamond out from within. Is that where the name came from? It is, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I, I've been stewing on it for a few years, actually, and I, I kind of came up with this metaphor for a feeling I actually had with this intrinsic potential I felt inside of myself, but it wasn't fully realized yet, but it was this frustration I was experiencing because I knew what I was capable of, but didn't have a way to explain that to the world around me. And so I got this picture of this block with a diamond inside of it, kind of like a marble block with ancient sculptors who would chisel away and little things would start to peek out. So it's kind of like... The diamond starts to peek out before you can see the whole thing. Uh -huh. People get little glimmers of the potential. They see a small success and praise you for it, but you're frustrated because it's not the whole thing. You're mm -hmm. like, okay, cool. You've seen a small bit of my potential, but you haven't actually seen everything I can do yet. But I can't really explain that to you in words because you just have to see it happen. Mm -hmm. So it was. It came, actually came out of a personal frustration that I was able to put into this metaphor and then that's now expanded into my business and into kind of bringing that power to other people and to other founders and startups and really helping them cultivate the potential and that I can see inside of them. That's a great story behind the name. Thank you. Yeah. I feel stupid because my podcast is called The Fire Show. <laughs> 
I didn't like the fire emoji. That's how it started. <laughs> it was Austin, fire emoji, and show. Well, that makes sense. Sure, let's do that. Hey, we all have our stories, right? I know. I like the diamond emoji, too, so. Yeah. It's really cute. <laughs> yeah, and it's in the logo, too? It's not. The emoji is not, but yes. there's a diamond. Okay. Yes. Okay. So, what were you doing before that? Before that, I was actually on the team at Sock Club here in Austin, and I was working as the creative brand manager. So basically, handling all things marketing and creative. Um, it's kind of this really unique role that I got to help create for myself there, uh, where I really brought the company through a time of transition, where we went from working on the east side of Austin out of a house with six of us, to moving into our first big office space off of Cesar Chavez. and. It was this really interesting year and a half period of kind of becoming a grown-up company in Austin and really establishing our legitimacy. And I got to be a big part of the brand process through that. And so I spent a lot of time there and really loved it, but felt like I was ready to fly and just have always had that internal desire to do my own thing and be my own boss. I don't really like rules. So... <laughs> I When you mentioned for the first time that you worked at Sock Club, mm -hmm. I went and followed the Instagram page of Sock Club and mm -hmm. the Facebook. That was some really good damn creative. Thank you. I remember, like, I think there was a photo every day. Uh huh. And for me, I couldn't conceptualize okay, a company sells socks. How could you make that creative? And <laughs> I remember seeing them every day and thinking, holy shit, that's good. How did she do it? So it was actually really, really good. And Thank you. the ability to tell a story with an object mm -hmm. on a specific platform, right? Instagram has its mm -hmm. own vibes. That's a skill that not many people are great at. Well, thank you. I think it's uh, one of those things, if you can sell a simple product and work within the constraints, the creative constraints of a platform, let's say Instagram, for example, I think you can sell anything. And so it's just learning how to be creative and use the constraints of both your product and your platform as boundaries, as kind of a sandbox to play in. I think it actually creates more creative freedom because you know what your boundaries are. Mm -hmm. And then from there, you say, okay, I know the constraints I have, and now how can I get really creative? And it forces you out of, you know, okay, socks, how creative can you get, really? Like, 365 days in a row and beyond, and then keep it going for years? How do you do that? And it really forces you to get inventive and start to tell stories because yeah. you can't just show the product over and over. People tune out. Yeah, exactly. You've got to keep them coming back. A really good example. I, I think I only started paying attention with the kind of educated mindset about a year ago when it came to social media mm -hmm. and understanding how people operate. Mm -hmm. And the constraints can really make you super, absolutely, just like you said, for example, if you have a 10 second Instagram story, mm -hmm. and you can up, you, what you can do if you have a 50 second video, upload it to your computer, chop it into five pieces, upload to your phone, and it's in here the next 20, it's in here in the last 24 hours. And you can put it on your Instagram story. I saw Gary Vaynerchuk do it. Yeah. And um, I was like, wow, that's creative as hell. Totally. You yeah. wouldn't necessarily think to do that outside of having those constraints put on you. Exactly. How did you get started in all of this? Like, well, take me back to when you were... Uh, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, well, I've always been inherently creative. Yeah. And this kind of comes back to the whole potential thing. I always knew as a kid and even as a young adult that I wanted to be in the creative world. Um, that actually really led me down my path. I started out with a marketing business marketing degree at A and M, and oh no, I, I, what? <laughs> it gets it gets better <laughs> if you're on the on the Longhorn side <laughs> here. So I started there, and I knew that I loved business, but I really felt that creative potential. Yeah. So I ended up at UT for my master's and and studied advertising. And so I got into kind of the creative world there, and went through the portfolio program to do art direction and copy, and really fell in love with the marriage of business and creative and that intersection that is kind of the marketing brand advertising world. And that was really how I stumbled in. And that's, I think, why I'm able now to work with clients because I understand their business challenges from a really high level strategy perspective, what their bottom line needs are and what the forces that be are to keep their business open and running mm -hmm. or their product selling. But I also really understand the creative process and how to bring that to them keeping in mind what they have to accomplish with their creative. So I think that background is really what has teed me up to be successful in this way. And it's just kind of unfolded, you know, one door opens after another that's gotten me to today. And so when you went to grad school for advertising, mm -hmm. uh, you took your creative core 
and the master's program was more of a training from like end to end the whole advertising process and the strategy that they're looking for yeah it really was it was um i kind of focused in there were multiple tracks but Mm -hmm. i kind of focused in on the creative piece of it but they definitely did really end-to-end training so the whole history of advertising all the way up to how do you actually create campaigns how do you develop strategy media buying media selling Mm -hmm. all parts and then i really honed in on actual creative execution Mm -hmm. so you know, anything from art directing a magazine ad to shooting a commercial to um, thinking about really creative installations using digital media, things like that. Yeah. That's really interesting. I'm getting fascinated by that yeah. more and more. What are some mistakes that people make when they just get into? For example, mm-hmm. uh, if I start a brand mm-hmm. and it's a magazine for young uh, millennials, the magic word, mm-hmm. um, who are interested in arts, mm-hmm. and I say, I want to go start advertising how should I even start thinking about that I think the biggest mistake people make when they're thinking about advertising is thinking too narrow Mm -hmm. they think about advertising as a billboard or a magazine ad or a commercial or they think about a brand as a logo or a tagline but they're actually missing the point that it's this 360 degree experience and it's it's kind of fluid and I think people really think in silos And to be honest, it's not really their fault. It's actually how traditional advertising started, was very siloed. I mean, watch Mad Men, you'll see that. You know, they're like, that's what they were doing. They're trying to sell um, ad space on the new TV program. They're trying to sell magazine ads, and it's very Mm one-dimensional. But the world we're in today is multidimensional, and if we're not thinking in that way, we're not thinking about the full spectrum of opportunities on the media scene and with technology, all of the opportunities we have to advertise, and how they all work together, mm-hmm. we're totally missing it. And I think people look at their budget or they think, okay, all I need is Google AdWords or all I need is um, this Spotify ad or all I need is this you know, print piece in a local Austin publication. Mm-hmm. But they're not looking at how those all strategically can play into each other and work together and make a bigger statement mm-hmm. than just these one-off ad buys, you know? Yeah. And yeah, and we keep hearing that, oh, um, now what I'm hearing a lot is Facebook video advertising is the thing, which I get, but it's also the whole strategic implications of the whole campaign over mm-hmm. two years and how you're going to execute not just one part of it. I know almost nothing about ads, though. Something I know probably isn't worth much. So, but so <clears throat> when you're talking about with a client about a campaign, mm-hmm. what do you first ask them? Because I think of it in terms of pitching, which is I know the problem I'm solving. Um, I know who's it, who it's for, mm-hmm. and I know my solution and why it's better than the customer and what's the go-to-market strategy. Mm-hmm. So do you have like modules like that that you think about? Yeah, I like to usually go back to the very beginning. And sometimes clients are like, why are we talking about this? Is, don't we already have this established? So what I mean by that is I'll go back to the beginning of the brand. Who are you? What are you selling? Because I think a lot of times brands actually don't even really know themselves that well. They mm-hmm. don't even really know what they're trying to accomplish or they think they're trying to sell this thing in this way, but they're completely missing this huge value proposition and what people actually buy their product for, or maybe why they actually engage with the brand. They're completely missing these insights because they haven't taken the time to study themselves. They're just so hung up on, let's advertise, let's sell the thing, you know, so they can miss it. Um, So I usually like to take it a few steps backwards, even if it feels counterproductive, because I think it's usually worth the time to see if there are any uncovered insights Mm -hmm. that we need to pull out first. And then I like to go into execution last. So we spend a good bulk of time getting to know the problem, really doing some analysis with each other, both for my sake and for theirs. I think it's a good reflection, but also for me to kind of learn their business, understand the challenges they're facing so that I can actually give really tailored advice from an educated standpoint, Mm -hmm. not just saying, oh, I have a magic bullet for you. It's Facebook video ad. You must do it, <laughs> you know? Yeah. But actually coming in with some valuable strategic advice given their real problem set, what they're facing. Understanding the customer. Right. I've asked a lot of people about what are some mistakes that entrepreneurs make. Mm-hmm. I don't know why I talk about mistakes all the time. Because <laughs> I made so many. But um, a lot of it is just people create products Um, just because they think they can and it's cool Mm -hmm. and they don't think about desirability, Mm -hmm. which is do people want it? And it's easy to lose complete touch 
with your customers super easy. Absolutely. Like, so Instagram, for example, mm -hmm. um, they just did, maybe this is more, whatever girl attacking means these days, <laughs> um, but do you know how they got started? Instagram? Yeah. It was just a photo sharing. It was something else before. Yeah. And um, it was the photo sharing segment of it, which people came again and again, mm -hmm. and they cut 95% of the app mm -hmm. and got back to photo sharing because they actually listened instead of saying, we're going to keep doing this mm -hmm. until this company dies. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's really important. And oftentimes, um, I mean, as entrepreneurs, our companies are our babies. We pour blood, sweat and tears into these ideas. And so I think we have a really hard time or we often can have a hard time detaching our emotions or mm -hmm. our own value from the idea itself. Yeah. And so then feedback can often be taken way too personally to the point where you're not willing to pivot or, or actually not willing to take that feedback mm -hmm. from the market or from a, another professional or consultant and you see resistance there mm -hmm. and then that really is the beginning of the end you know when you're not willing to take the feedback to iterate you're not going to grow mm -hmm. and and that's a challenge you know even working with leaders and professionals i come up with this challenge all the time people are like well this is how we've done it i've seen this work and it's like great the entire media landscape has changed in the yeah. last five years you can't just keep doing what you've done it's not going to keep working the same so i think we have to be willing to take the feedback listen it sounds like instagram has done that and obviously instagram is king in a lot of ways right now they're killing it you know they've in my opinion opinion are putting snapchat in their grave so uh -huh. they're doing something right obviously they're doing something right yeah there's a reason to go you go back to it, right? Yeah, we're all addicted to it. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I have no... I've had this phone for um, two months. No, 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 no. Three weeks. Sorry. Mm. It feels old. <laughs> uh, it's funny how new things do that, right? Yeah, uh, right. But um, I don't have any social media apps on this. Mm. I can post from it um, for, on my Facebook page uh, and my um, Twitter through Buffer. Mm -hmm. And I have no social media. So, like, for example, last night I was at Brew and Brew uh -huh. and I was bored... And I pulled out my phone and I looked at him like, shit, I can't do anything on my phone. Because <laughs> it is very addictive. They've built it that way. And you mentioned the media landscape changing over the last two years. It's also like when Snapchat became popular, it's now we're not used to that six second, mm -hmm. 10 second interaction. Mm -hmm. um, and people were able to tell a story over 10 sets, uh, 10 units mm -hmm. of that six to 10 minute um, second story, mm -hmm. those kill it mm -hmm. really well. And people who, it's not a necessarily an age thing, mm -hmm. but people who are set in their ways that make it one minute, 30 minute ad on TV, don't see that mm -hmm. and they can't adjust. It's true. And, you know, I think there's still some room for traditional media in the mix. I don't think that all traditional media is dead, but I do think as marketers and advertisers, we have to be paying attention to what's happening in the landscape and be willing to advise accordingly to clients and then try to bring our clients along with, mm -hmm. you know, that's, it's a challenge, but I think a big key there is education and informing and saying, this is why I'm not just trying to make you change to ruin your life, you know, <laughs> I'm just not being difficult for you. Right. Exactly. Yeah. But I actually have a reason for this. Mm -hmm. So we've, if I'm a client, right, and I come up with this art magazine, we've talked about what I'm looking for, you've talked about why this started, mm -hmm. and so next you talk about goals? Yeah, usually what are you trying to accomplish and how can I help? Um, and that's still something, to be quite honest, I'm, I'm sorting out in my process is what value do I want to add or what services do I want to offer? Yeah. I'm somewhat of a jack of all trades and so I can do the execution, I can pixel push, I can design, web, graphic, all day, or I can sit here and whiteboard with you for hours and we can iron out some strategy and timelines, you know, and I have everything in between that mm -hmm. I can work on. And so really it's like, where are you today and what do you need most? Mm -hmm. And something I'm really adamant on is not trying to sell a client something that they don't need. Yeah. So, you know, like those senior picture packages they sell you where you get like 50 wallets and like four eight by tens and then like some other random sizes that you're never going to look at. Like, I don't want to be that senior photo seller that just gives you this package of junk that you're literally never going to use. You don't need 50 wallets, mm -hmm. you know, but I want it to be exactly the solution that my client needs. But of course, from a business operations standpoint, there's like the scalability of that. How can you do that and yeah. repeat it? 
So I'm learning right now how to best meet the needs and, and really find what the consistent problem is yeah. that I'm trying to solve and for. Repeat that until it scales. Exactly. And, yeah. and start to identify what are the patterns I'm noticing from yeah. founder to founder to founder or business to business. What are the different things that are consistent needs that are being expressed? Mm-hmm. And, and what are the goals that need to be set? What are the challenges that need to be taken on? That's really interesting. I'm, I've been thinking a lot. Uh, about process Mm -hmm. and this idea that you should work on your business not in your business and even things like hiring or so basic but so important so important and uh, I just told this someone I set up a process for the podcast which is that what I want to do is schedule the interview with someone meet them interview it interview them put in the intro and send it over to the editor Mm -hmm. and the rest my assistant will take care of it yeah. Um, and I wrote a whole, I think it was five pages, then I cut it down, mm-hmm. three pages, made two documents, finally got an assistant, fired her five days later, <laughs> got a new one, because that stuff is difficult. Like, And that's just one part of oper- operationalizing yes. and scaling. Yes, and it's hard too as a founder, again, like these projects are our yeah. babies, so yeah. to let go of control, even if you could do it perfectly, you can't do it all perfectly all the time. So you have to be willing to kind of detach from some of those things and create.